How important is sports in China? Why does China win gold medals in Olympic sports but have few world-class commercial leagues or professional athletes? Why did tennis great Li Na become champion after she left the state system to fly solo, as they say? Why is the NBA so popular among Chinese people? Does the reform of China's sports reflect the reform of China's society? Welcome to Closer to China. In 2009, Li Na left China's sports system and went independent, which allowed her to become a professional tennis player internationally. She joined three other top female players from China, Zheng Jie, Yan Zi, and Peng Shu Ai. It was not only a life-changing decision for Li Na, but also a difficult decision for China's sports authority to allow their own top athletes to depart. The Chinese and foreign media were wondering if this was a sign that China's sports industry was now ready to embrace the world market. They also wanted to see how Li Na, as someone coming from a rather confining system, would adapt to this highly commercialized career path. Two years later, Li Na won the 2011 French Open. It was the first Grand Slam championship for a Chinese player and the first time the title was won by an Asian player. Li Na was suddenly a star. When you were growing up as a child, uh, tennis was not so popular in China. Uh, you made it popular, but as a child, how did you get into tennis? Actually, I started with badminton first at the age of six, and when I was eight, I got to learn about tennis. And how has tennis uh, changed during your career in terms of Chinese society? I think the development of the game of tennis can date back to the time when Sun Tiantian and Li Ting won the 2004 Athens Olympics. That's when people started to pay attention to tennis. Let's talk a little bit about your tennis career. If you had to pick one moment that was your greatest moment of, of, of internal feeling, and, and at the other side, your most difficult moment, what would those two extremes be? Maybe people would say the greatest moment is when I won the Grand Slam, but I'd say it was when I lost the final of the Australian Open. I saw the trophy at a short distance and felt that I had been so close to my first Grand Slam, yet I lost it. It was the most difficult moment for me. Although it was just a step away, that was a very difficult step. Not every professional player had such experiences. That one step needs 100% or 150% of hard work plus opportunities. Because of what you've achieved, you have an opportunity of great significance to make changes in China, in tennis, but in sports in general, and indeed in society in general. How, how do you look to the future now that you can see a, a larger future based on your great success? What can you contribute to China? I never thought I made tremendous contributions or achieved great success. Tennis is just what I love, the career that I have a passion for, and that I will go all out to live my dream. I always believe the future of sports in China will get better and better, be it with tennis or other sports, because I see a growing number of sports lovers. In my opinion, the more people participate, the greater their competitive competence will be. You are interviewed very frequently by the Western media all the time. Um, what are the kinds of questions that the Western media will ask you that make you uncomfortable? I am most uncomfortable when asked about the system and my flying independent. I hate the term flying independent. It was actually coined by the media. For me, I just think that our reform made the tennis players more professional. From the founding of the 
People's Republic of China in 1949, the government decided to marshal all the nation's strength into developing athletes for world competitions. The system is known as the Jubo system, the whole nation system. Experts like Bao Ming Xiao say that system provided athletes like Li Na with a proper foundation to take her career internationally. I think Li Na leaving the system was a big event in China's transition in the sports industry. Without the foundations, both technically and professionally provided by the Ju Guo system, she couldn't possibly succeed in self-employment. Currently, we are diversifying our approaches in developing the system and embracing a more open environment. Tennis is a highly professionalized sport in the international arena and a good start for our transition. Actually, we voluntarily facilitated Li Na and three other women tennis players to compete in the international professional championships. Li Na is actually a great representative for the Jiguo system in the new era, in the way the system gives her a foundation for her huge success later on. So her success does not belong only to herself, but also to the nation and the society. We recognize Li Na's achievement and believe the criticism of her personality does not represent the mainstream. Under the Jubo system, the state runs everything in sports, from the athlete's training to the construction of sports sites for events. In past decades, China achieved great success, winning large numbers of gold medals at the Olympic Games and even ranking first at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. A stark contrast from the 1952 Olympics in Finland, where Team China arrived 10 days after the Games started and barely made it to the closing ceremony. The Chinese sports industry has made dramatic progress in the last several decades, particularly as an Olympic sport. And most people credit the whole nation system, the so-called Juguo Tijiu. Uh, what is the Juguo system? How does it work in China? Essentially, it is a system under which the state runs the sports industry by exercising its administrative power limited by funding and other resources. This strategy is adapted to poor resources and speed up development in crucial areas. In China, a sports department was established to set up and run the system of sports education outside that of public education. Has the the systematic approach to sports in China, changing the spirit of the Olympics from individuals, individual competition to state competition. I only partly agree. First, I admit that our gold medal Washington attitude at the Olympics in the past was not a proper one, as it hindered a balanced development. But at the same time, for a developing country like China, guidance is needed to develop the sports industry. As the system is a triad of sports schools, competitive sports and recreational sports, breakthroughs should be made in at least one of them to promote mass participation. So competitive sports becomes our strategic choice in line with historical backgrounds. What happens to the Jugo system in this new changing China where everything is market driven, where the market plays a decisive role in the economy? 
Now, with rapid economic and social development that give rise to a stronger society in the market, reforms are launched to merely really keep in the system sports that fail society in the market in terms of interest or competence, while leaving others to the power of the non-governmental bodies. So the general trend is smaller scale for the Zhuguo system and a growing share for the market and society. One of the arguments uh, that says that it will be difficult for China to continue to grow its sports industries compared to the U.S. or, or West is that in China much of the success in sports has been in those sports that don't have a lot of commercial value particularly Olympic kinds of sports whereas in the US the sports industries are dominated by American football and NBA and professional baseball and, and hockey and, and these are each one huge generators of income where, but China does not have those same levels of professional sports it's not a value judgment about which is better or worse, it's just the reality in terms of building an industry. Having realized the problem, the State Council issued a national document last year to resolve the issue. Now we want to drive professional development in sports through more league matches in football, basketball and volleyball, even in the field of table tennis and badminton, as America does in the four major leagues. Yet with only 20 years of development in league matches, we're still a green hand compared with the past century in America, or at least the last 50 or 60 years of development. After years of development, sports in China has evolved from traditional entertainment like ping pong to an actual industry in which fans and enthusiasts follow their favorite teams. There's the China Table Tennis Super League founded in 2000 and now one of the world's top table tennis events a badminton super league, a volleyball league, the Chinese Basketball Association, and the China Football Super League. Even marathons are gaining ground. Today there are more than 50 of them each year, which attract about 900,000 runners. The result of a growing market is that a number of high-profile foreign athletes are visiting China, like the Argentinian footballer Lionel Messi and American basketball player Kobe Bryant. Some of them even engage with fans on Chinese social media. In 2013, David Beckham was named an ambassador of the Chinese Football Super League, and Chinese teams are now including foreign athletes, especially in football and basketball. Then there are the Chinese athletes who are drumming up enthusiasm for sports, like the basketball giant Yao Ming, who boosted China's image abroad when he played for the NBA in the U.S. Domestically, there's a growing number of sports heroes, like Ning Zi Tao, Liu Xiang, Ling Dan, and Zhou Shiming. Chinese football is perhaps a good paradigm for what been happening in China. Uh, in the uh, Chinese uh, Football League, we have many of China's new rich entrepreneurs, billionaires, supporting individual uh, football clubs and beginning to compete. Uh, and uh, football in China is now similar to the structure of football in the United States, where the major teams are owned, at least in part, by some of the wealthiest people in the country uh, who give great support. Uh, do you see this as a, um, a, uh, a harbinger of, of, of things to come in terms of structure? I believe football is a good example of a highly professionalized sport in the world. Developing such sports requires huge capital flow in the market. The trend of major private investors supporting football clubs applies to both China and the Western world. 
As more professionalism and a specialized division of labor hold the key to success in profession, a large amount of investment is a must for driving such trends. One of the important obstacles to China's professional development in football is the lack of professionalism in our football clubs, to the improvement of which capital is a main driver. In 1994, football in China, or soccer as it's known in America, took its first step to test the market, becoming the first professionalized sport in China. This opened China's sports industry to attract private capital. One example is Wang Jianlin, president of the major Chinese conglomerate Wanda, who in 1993 started investing in sports. The reason I invested in football is very simple. I just wanted to do my best to help promote Chinese football. I want to make it an industry, a fully developed industry. I want to develop Chinese football into a profitable industry with solid rules and regulation. In 2014, Jack Ma, president of the e-commerce giant Alibaba, purchased the Everbright Football Club, now known as the Guangzhou Evergrande Taobao Football Club, the most famous club in China. After more than 20 years of development, professional football in China has had its ups and downs. There was corruption, very public scandals in which officials were jailed, but now Chinese football has become a highly commercial market and a pioneering and vital force of China's rapidly developing sports industry. When you talk about the marketization of Chinese football, it's, it is still in its, in its 20th. It's, it's a very, still a very young age. Uh, however, because of the very fast economic development uh, and also huge investment from the private business sector in Chinese football in the league, despite several setbacks, uh, some boycotts by some uh, very disappointed clubs uh, crying for, you know, uh, ill management and operations. I think the Chinese league now is on back on its right track. It has already become uh, at least one of the top three uh, football leagues in Asia, especially after uh, in 2013, uh, the Chinese champion of the Super League, uh, the Guangzhou Evergrande, uh, won the Asian uh, Professional uh, Cup. With its state sports system, China wins remarkable numbers of gold medals in the Olympics and World Championships. But the system is criticized in China as focusing too much on elite athletes and too little on mass sports participation. The government seeks reform, exploring ways for sports to embrace the market economy. In 2010, China's State Council authorized the country's sports industry to reform. Now, five years later, what has actually changed? I asked the CEO of NBA China how the sports market is working and why the NBA is so successful here. With the boom of China's sports market, not only are Chinese entrepreneurs flooding in, but also foreign investors. The NBA launched its China branch in 2008, just a few months before the Beijing Olympic Games. The NBA now broadcasts more than 200 games a year on China's major TV channels and has developed a whole series of product lines, including on China's social media. David, you were named CEO of NBA China in 2011. When you first came here, what was the market like? How did people react to the NBA? And what's happened since? Well, it, it's kind of a funny story because 
when I was named uh, CEO of NBA China in 2011, I'd actually lived in China and worked in China for two years prior as the head of the WTA in the region. And I had looked with great envy at what the NBA had been doing. It was really the model of international sport. NBA China had set the standard. And so I was really fortunate to inherit a great business. Frankly, thanks to all of the great things that Yao had, has done for the game of basketball and for the NBA in China, our game has never been more popular today, or th than it is today. Uh, over 300 million fans in the NBA. We have 93 million uh, fans and followers on our social media account. And just last year, 600 million, over 600 million people tuned into an NBA game in China. So if you think of it as we have, you know, roughly 1.3 billion people in China, almost one in every two people watched at least one NBA game in China last year. And that, to me, is a pretty staggering. What, what are the core uh, aspects of your business in China? I mean, what are the core elements that generate revenue? We're, we're actually f quite fortunate that it's a pretty diversified business. But when I think of it, it's, you know, we have a television business, we have a digital media business, we have a merchandising business, we have a sponsorship business, we have an events business. And then we have, interestingly enough, have new and growing businesses that we've never done before and that we've never done anywhere else in the world, um, such as we call it our branded destinations business, where we're building an NBA center on the outskirts of Beijing and we're soon to build some children's play zones and things like that. How do you account for the NBA's tremendous success commercially in China? NBA I'd like to attribute the NBA success in China to the following reasons. To begin with, it is the first of the four major leagues to enter China's market through TV programs. Then David Stern, the former NBA commissioner, has made great contributions to the internationalization of the sport. Under his management, NBA players were encouraged to compete in the Olympics and achieve great popularity as members of the renowned Dream Team. They not only won gold medals, but also successfully promoted the American Basketball League worldwide. In 2014, China's State Council officially issued directives for developing China's sports industry. Besides encouraging the industry's commercial development, the government emphasized public participation in sports. The plan is that, by the end of 2025, all neighborhoods in China should be equipped with public sports facilities. Sports is a very general concept. It stands for the strength of a country. It is a kind of art or culture. So to understand what sports are, we need to see a bigger picture. The first priority for developing sports is to boost public interest in sports. It is huge responsibility for sports in China. Competitive sports and public sports are not contradictory. With the growth of competitive sports, the public will be inspired to do exercises and participate in sports. And with the change in the public's drive for sports, there will be more people joining competitive sports. This is a win-win situation. The Olympic gold medals once boosted the public's passion for sports. Today, in many neighborhoods, you can see people jogging in parks or practicing Tai Chi. What are some of the obstacles or challenges for China's sports industry to truly grow and become a great contributor to society and become to China what sports industries are in Western countries? In the past, we emphasized competitive sports, particularly the Olympics, with massive investment. But in the future, we will concentrate more on recreational sports and professional sports. 
By shifting the focus of our support, we will overcome obstacles in the former government-run and administration-sponsored system to allow the market and society to gradually become the dominant engine for the industry. But it's an evolutionary process. The government's guidance and support in crucial areas are still needed at the early stage for a newcomer in sports like China. They actually facilitate further improvement in the industry. I think the, uh, the issue of uh, encouraging the public, especially young people still in school, to participate in more active athletic and sporting events and, and you know and competitions and practices uh, are in very important strategic I think it has several uh, main reasons in the backdrop one because China is now undergoing uh, some fundamental changes in its development model the old development model cannot sustain China is uh, very painfully but also uh, very decided with, with you know with uh, great courage and resolve to carry on this change it's about creating jobs it's about diverting uh, GDP growth from manufacturing to you know uh, services and providing services receiving services and generating uh, income and contribution to the overall economy and secondly you know if you look at those uh, uh, facilities around the country after the Olympics and many other sporting events they shouldn't be constructed f only for the 16 day or a month uh, long uh, super tournaments they need to be used, utilized they need to be used by the public by the by the mass public and thirdly and that's even long term you have 1.3 to 1.4 billion people you need to keep them healthy and uh, they shouldn't be a burden on the country's health care system if you would look ahead 15 or 20 years how would you portray China's sports industry then let's just make it 10 years 20 is a bit beyond prediction in 10 years the output of the sports industry will grow as is noted in the directive of the state council to 5 trillion RMB it will overtake the film and auto industries in China as it did in America, to emerge as a pillar in the service sector and one that drives nationwide transformation and improves the people's livelihood. Both the general public and the national economy will benefit. With 1.3 billion people, China's transformation in sports will create huge opportunities for both domestic and international investors. China's sports mirrors China's society. The state system made China an Olympic power. Yet as the market plays a more decisive role in the economy, as society becomes more individualistic, as professional sports become more important, the state system becomes less relevant. The Chinese people are very patriotic, some would say nationalistic. Sports is an excellent outlet for such genuine emotions. I marvel how the Chinese people love Li Na, Yao Ming, and even their national football team, which, to be charitable, has struggled for years. As a matter of policy, China's leaders see the reform and development of China's sports industries as beneficial for multiple reasons, enhancing quality of life through wholesome entertainment and physical exercise, transforming the economy from investment and exports to domestic consumption, channeling competitive and patriotic emotions, and helping to narrow the gaps in Chinese society. Poorer people enjoy sports just like richer people. Sports in China reflects change in China. Sports in China gets us closer to China.